the question has been, how does that momentum be sustained after this week? What does the party need to do in the coming days here in Chicago to keep this going until the election? Well, I think importantly, what we're doing back home in Virginia is making a pitch to voters about what's on the line with this election, what matters, uh, why people need to get out and vote. And what I expect to occur is uh, coming out of this convention, the continued conversation about the stakes of this election, the choice that we have certainly at the presidential and vice presidential level, but even at the Senate level in Virginia, we have Senator Tim Kaine up for reelection and at the congressional level where we have uh, some incumbents running for reelection as well as some challengers. Uh, and so that momentum, I, I think will continue. We've had uh, a more than a 500 percent increase uh, in volunteer signups back home in the Commonwealth. So it's it's an exciting time, but it's because people know what's at stake. Each member of the party, certainly every lawmaker coming to town here is, is coming with a, a different set of issues, a different set of values you might suggest. And in Virginia, it's interesting as you butt up against the capital city, you have a massive federal workforce That's right. working in your state whose jobs could be on the line, depending on the outcome of this election. That's exactly right. And we have, have seen through Agenda 2025, through Agenda 47, or mm. Project 2025 and Agenda 47, uh, we know that there are major shifts that uh, uh, President Trump and a Vice President Vance would make to the federal workforce. Uh, Vance himself said that his advice would be to fire every federal worker and replace them with, quote, our people. Mm. Uh, so the stakes of this election are dire for so many Virginians and, and certainly the federal workforce, the very function of, gover of government, uh, but the Virginia economy. Um, and so it's something that we're talking about across the Commonwealth, the reality that when you have a presidential and vice presidential candidate who wants to do away with those jobs, those yeah. livelihoods, uh, that's a major risk, certainly to those individuals, to their lives, mm -hmm. to their jobs, but also to our economy. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we've all paid attention to what Trump and the Trump Vance ticket broadly have outlined in terms of what they'd like to see with their domestic agenda. Agenda. There's also the foreign policy agenda. We know, for example, Senator Vance is highly skeptical of continuing to help fund Ukraine and its effort against Russia. Certainly there is some contrast between these two tickets when it comes to the issue of Israel and Gaza, something we expect to be fully on display here in Chicago with protests. Given your seat on the Intelligence Committee, your background at the CIA, how should we be thinking about the foreign policy implications of this election? The foreign policy implications of this election are extraordinary. Uh, and I say that as a current member of Congress, as you mentioned, a member of the Intelligence Committee, but also as a former national security professional as a CIA officer. Uh, the things that that J.D. Vance has said about, uh, about our support to the Ukrainians, I think, uh, just Dis, d discounts the entire importance and value of American global leadership, uh, of our commitment to our NATO allies. Certainly, we saw under President Trump's first uh, presidential term his constant uh, alienating of our allies, his efforts to pull us away from NATO, which is an extraordinarily important alliance. Um, and the, the contrast is, is clear. And a, a Trump Vance administration would imperil our national security, would imperil our position of global leadership. Uh, and from a national security perspective, I think would be a dire, dire circumstance, um, particularly uh, as we see on the ground in Ukraine, the Ukrainians fighting for their freedom. Um, and we see commitment to uh, the cause of democracy worldwide uh, under threat. Remember the race in 2008, Hillary Clinton famously had the 3 a.m. call ad, you know, is your commander in chief going to be ready when the phone rings at 3 a.m.? She was referring to her experience at the time and, of course, then became secretary of state in, a, in another career. Um, when we consider the stakes in this election, after everything that you just said, why is Kamala Harris ready for that phone call at 3 a.m.? What experience brings her to that point? Well, importantly, she spent time as a member of the United States Senate on the Senate Intelligence Committee. So recognizing the breadth and the scope of information coming in from the intelligence community, from the extraordinary individuals working the world over to help policymakers make informed decisions. I'm proud I used to be one of those folks, and now I'm on the policymaking side. Um, so in that role, she knows the full scope of what comes before 
uh, policymakers. As vice president, she has had a seat in the room at every major decision, whether it was sharing initial intelligence related to the our knowledge that the Russians were going to invade Ukraine, um, or you know anything across the board. Since that war began, she has been part of uh, the decisions being made. She has been in the room, and she knows the reality and the the dire consequences of uh, each situation. Situation and, and what the American response needs to be and, and has been. And finally, Congresswoman, before we let you go, this election also will, of course, mark the last one you are in as a sitting member of Congress. You are not seeking re-election to that body, instead pursuing uh, the governor of Virginia. Before you go, though, knowing we're going to be in full election cycle mode, maybe not a lot's going to happen between now, maybe the lame duck session. I know there's some things you want to get done, including the Stock Act, yeah. restrictions on trading for members. Are you confident you can get that done before you leave the chamber? Oh, so it's a busy time on Capitol Hill. Sure. And the, 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 the Trust in Congress Act, which is the one that would put uh, restrictions on members of Congress from being able uh, to buy or sell individual stocks, right, uh, is so vitally important because when we think over the past number of years, the degradation of trust that people have had, the low approval rating of Congress, um, our ability to say when we are here, every decision we make is a decision we are making because it is one that is informed by information, by intelligence, by conversations we're having with experts in certain fields, and not by how we might benefit or our stock portfolio might benefit. Um, in terms of how confident I am, the, the bill is wholly bipartisan. Mm -hmm. We've got folks across the political spectrum supporting it because it just makes sense. It's wildly popular with the American people. Um, and I ultimately will continue to push for Speaker Johnson to bring that bill for a vote. Um, but I am tempering my, my, my my enthusiasm on our ability to get it through, but I will say that I have already lined up my successor to carry it on. If we do not get it this Congress, I promise you we will continue to have an aggressive effort to get it done.